Sorry. <clears throat> Ready? Welcome and good evening to the number, the third meeting of the regular meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Uh, could I have a roll call by the town manager, please? Uh, yes, uh, Chairman Sullivan. Here. Councilor Jordan. Councilor Jordan is absent, attending another meeting in Portland. Councilor McCausland. Here. Councilor Ray. Here. Councilor Sherman. Here. Councilor Wagner. Councilor Walsh. Here. May we please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which we stand, one nation under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Will it? Town Manager record the arrival of Council Wagner. Do I have any correspondence or reports uh, from any of the councillors? I have several. I'd like to thank the Public Works Department for their continuing efforts with all the snow we've been getting. And they've been hard hit with the flu. <laughs> So they've had some staffing issues during this, this, this storm season. So thank you very much for all that you do. Um, we are, um, the town is entertaining applicants for a new Senior Citizens Advisory Commission. Um, that deadline is Monday the 17th, so I encourage all those uh, listening at home as well as folks here, if you're interested in serving in that committee, there is still time to apply. Also, the Thomas Memorial Library has a vacancy, an unexpected term that uh, goes through the end of 2014. That deadline for application is uh, February 21st. So applications can uh, be filled out online through the town website or in person at town hall. So anyway, thank you. Um, Councilor Walsh, the finance report, please. Uh, you've got uh, complete uh, 27 pages in your packet. Um, makes for good reading. Uh, the first, first page is probably where the, the most of your emphasis should be placed. There's nothing um, out of the ordinary to report this evening other than for you to uh, look at your March and April calendars and plan on budget workshops on March 17th and 19th in March. And in April, uh, the workshop for budgets is planned for the 16th and 17th of April. And then the final hearing on the budget will take place in May, and the adoption of that budget should be held on May 12th. So you've got March 17, 19, April 16, 17, and then um, headed for uh, a hearing and then ultimate adoption of the budget, provided everything goes the way it's supposed to, on the 12th of May. Thank you. Thank you, Council Walsh. Any, any questions? <clears throat> uh, we now have an opportunity for citizens to uh, uh, approach the council and discuss items that are not on tonight's agenda. Is there anyone wishing to do that for items not on the agenda tonight? No, seeing none, we'll move on. And the town manager's monthly report, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Chairman Sullivan. I wanted to uh, briefly talk about two things. For, first, I wanted to note the passing of Pauline Neipert. Uh, some of you may have noted it uh, in this morning's uh, newspaper. Uh, she's a <coughs> Kennebunk resident, but more important, she's a longtime Cape Elizabeth resident. And her, her husband, Ken, was actually Cape Elizabeth's second town manager uh, uh, after Alan Marks. Uh, Pauly, uh, after Ken, went, while he was town manager, passed away, uh, you know, in rather sudden, quick illness. And uh, Pauly had worked earlier in the South Portland City Hall, and she had left there when, when Ken was working here. And a, a couple of folks suggested that maybe Pauly <coughs> might like to come work here at the town office. And she ended up, uh, she, she was here and she did some of the tax work in the tax office. Uh, ended up as the secretary to Quint Spector, who was the town manager. Uh, was here with John Henchy all the years he was here. And then she, she was my secretary, uh, both my time as the assistant as well as uh, 
uh, during my first year as town manager. And, uh, you know, just, just a wonderful woman, uh, extremely devoted to the town. Uh, she uh, was just uh, great to work with. Uh, she, she survived by the three sons, uh, Neil, Stephen, and Jim. Uh, her daughter, Jan Curry, some of you might have known, uh, lived here a long time. Her granddaughter uh, is uh, married to some of the Porch family at uh, the Two Lives Lobster Shack. Uh, so the family still has real strong ties here in Cape Elizabeth. And, Elizabeth. and Polly was, it was just a wonderful woman, and uh, I know will be missed by uh, her family and uh, her friends, as, as well as those that knew her uh, uh, when she worked here at the town office. So uh, God bless her. Uh, Secondly, uh, I want to mention briefly state revenue sharing. Uh, some of you may have read the newspaper uh, and seen from the Maine Municipal Association uh, that there's, there's talk and there's, there's an issue about cutting revenue sharing. And what revenue sharing is, it's a program whereby a certain percentage of state revenues is supposed to be shared by the cities and towns around the state. And the legislature has tended to you know, the money is sort of put into this little fund, but the legislature has tended to raid that fund. Uh, for, for example, in 1996, Cape Elizabeth received $540,000 from this fund, and I think everyone would know that since 1996, the state has a lot more money than it once did from income tax, from sales tax, everything else. Yet the amount Cape Elizabeth is receiving this year is $451,000. So we're actually, you know, about 90000 below where we were in in, in 96. Uh, you know, the proposals that, you know, that uh, some in Augusta have is to eliminate the program, totally. Uh, so that means, you know, next year's budget uh, would be impacted $451,000. That equals 27 cents on the tax rate, or even, you know, without looking at anything else, it would increase the overall tax rate uh, by 1.7%. Uh, you know, we, it, at one point we received as high as $740,000. Uh, so, you know, it, it's been cut about $300,000. And, you know, what does that mean in, in the, the big scheme of things? If you look back at 1996, the state supported about 13% of the municipal budget. Today, it's 6.3% of the municipal budget. For, so, you know, whenever you see the plows out there, whenever you see whatever it is, that the, the, all, the different, all the different services that you see, uh, you know, at one point the state was paying 13% of those costs, now they're paying 6.3. If revenue sharing is eliminated, the state's support of the municipal activities here would be 1.3%. Uh, so, you know, whether or not, uh, you know, I obviously don't think it's right, but I let others determine their own conclusions. You know, it, it's, it's a promise that the state made to municipalities that they're, they're broken through Democratic administrations and Republican administrations legislatures of both parties, and, uh, you know, it's, it's just very sad that it happens, and, uh, you know, it, it's about time that uh, we stop the cuts from occurring, and I hope that in the next uh, few weeks the legislature, you know, listens to all the municipal officials uh, from across the state uh, who, who went there in that issue. We didn't. We usually don't go to lobby in Augusta for money uh, for reasons that are probably clear to everyone. Uh, but we, a lot of other communities do, and, you know, particularly up in Arista County and other places, uh, you know, they're, they're really suffering terribly from the cuts that have already occurred. We, uh, you know, we're impacted here as well. But uh, anyway, I, I hope as, as folks read the, those newspaper stories, that provides a little bit of <coughs> local perspective on how it impacts this community. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, thank you, Mike. <coughs> uh, Next, uh, we need to review the January 6 minutes. Um, could I have a motion to accept the January, January 6 minutes? Council Ray? Second. Council Walsh, are there any uh, corrections? Anyone find? I have several. Um, they're just typos, but page two. Uh, Sarah Lennon, 34 Cranbrook Drive, asked a series of questions, not serious. <laughs> it was a serious question, but that's not. <laughs> I'm sure that wasn't the way it was supposed to be recorded. And on page four, uh, in the middle of the page, moved, ordered the town of 
the Cape Elizabeth Town Council approves the Cape Elizabeth Town Council goals. Town, all that's capitalized, and town is not. Again, this is a typo, but we will get it correct. A anyone else have anything? No? Okay. Um, all those in favor of accepting the January 6, 2014 minutes as corrected? Mm -hmm. Council, oh, oh, we already did that. Council Ray? I'm sorry. All those in favor? Head it up earlier. Opposed? No, it's unanimous. Head up, put it down. Okay. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> now moving on, item number 38. Before we begin, uh, Council Wagner, would you please be so kind as to join the audience while we deliberate on item 38? Thank you. This is the report from the Ordinance Committee on the Draft Shooting Range Ordinance. And uh, I would like to ask Councilor Ray, who is the Chairman of the Ordinance Committee, to introduce this item. Thank you. Um, I assume you've all received the, uh, the, the, the ordinance, just the, the report. The Do you want me to read the draft. report? Yeah. Read, the, read it in its entirety? Yes. Mean? Do you want me to? I don't think that's necessary no. in any, no. unless any council. All right. No. No. What I'd like to do is just um, do an overview of the highlights of the shooting range ordinance process. Um, first of all, well, it's not first of all, but the town council workshop um, of September 5th, 2013, um, where we reviewed legal issues with Ken Cole and historical data. Um, then there were historical documents that are in the uh, town council. Um, I want to just say there, it's in the town council. In the records. Yes. The yeah. Historical records. So um, it's a little bit um, long, but anyway, there was a 1995 letter from Monaghan Leahy with state laws. There's a 1995 HMB Associates gun noise analysis. There is a 1995 letter from CEO Ernie McVean. There's a June 1995 letter from Abutters supporting the gun club. There's a 1996 memo from Mike McGovern to the town council. There's a 1996 letter from Ellen Mugar and John Leisure. Um, there's a May 1996 letter from Committee for Concerned Neighbors with Disturbing the Peace Ordinance Firearms Ordinance. There's a 1996 Dominicus Crossing application of summary of gun club, Spurwink Rudd and gun club rules. There's a 1999 letter from Councillor Barry. There's a petition for enactment of an ordinance. There's a March 1999 town council workshop. There's a May 1999 memo that gun club will not participate in mediation but will maintain a log book. There's a November 99 letter that town council will not pursue any additional efforts. So um, I received that from um, Maureen McGovern. And in addition to that, we have heard from many references to town bylaws in 1941, 1951, permits granted in 1955, and subsequent regulations such as the Disturbing the Peace Ordinance and the Firearms Ordinance. Um, the town council had a meeting December 9th, 2013, in reference to the shooting range ordinance, which they referred to the ordinance committee. The ordinance committee had three meetings, which were all held in January, um, January 10th, 17th, and 24th, and we carefully went through every word and every public comment we received. There were me meaningful changes made to ordinance during the review, such as composition of the firing range committee, time to submit application for license, clarifying standards to explicitly include types of guns, ammunition, etc., used at the range. There are many emails and letters received and public comments from 28 people or more since we seem to be getting them this afternoon um, during ordinance committee meetings. And we received comments from different perspectives, especially from the abutting neighborhood and from the Spurwink Rod and Gun Club. I'd like to thank the staff support 
from Special Legal Counsel Ken Cole, Town Manager Mike McGovern, Police Chief Neil Williams, Code Enforcement Officer Ben McDougall, Town Planner Maureen McGovern, uh, Maureen, excuse me, Maureen O'Mara, sorry Mike, and uh, I would also like to thank Councilor Sullivan and Walsh for their participation in the Ordinance Committee. I'd like to thank all the members of the public who participated by emails, letters, attendance, and comments at meetings. And I'd like to thank Ken Cole for his expertise in guiding the town to its first shooting range ordinance and to staff, many of whom will assume responsibilities to administer the first shooting range ordinance if proposed by the Town Council of Cape Elizabeth. The Town Council is not required to, requ to create a shooting range ordinance, but we are attempting to work with concerned citizens to help resolve the issue brought before us. The Ordinance Committee has tried to strike a balance that preserves safety for all citizens in their homes with limited regulation. We had to work within state and federal limits on local regulatory authority and also with the realization that we would be unable to fully satisfy all concerned. I recommend that town councilors with questions about the substance of the ordinance avail themselves of Mr. Cole's attendance this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Ray. Um, before we go into a 15-minute period of public comment, which is we, which is always uh, allowed with each item. I think this would, there, this would be a good time to ask Mr. Cole, the town's attorney on this matter, to address some of the issues that we have been hearing about most frequently, like the 1941 ordinance, the grandfathering status, um, and so forth. Uh, I think for the benefit of those here and at home, um, to hear some of this from the attorney that's guiding us. So um, if Mr. Cole would take the podium and talk to us about a couple of those issues. Thank Please. you, Madam Chairman, I'd be happy to. Um, I would first emphasize um, the subcommittee chairman's uh, remarks. It was uh, three meetings on three uh, early Friday mornings. They were well attended and a lot of input at them. And I would also emphasize the, the point that she made initially, which is that there is absolutely no legal requirement whatsoever for this ordinance. As was pointed out in the historical record, there have actually been requests before for similar ordinances to this that never were fulfilled. Uh, so you're at the point here where there is actually a draft ordinance uh, before uh, this council, which has never happened before. In regard to the 1941 Disturbing the Peace Ordinance, which we keep getting um, emails on, I would refer anyone to read it in its entirety. In one place, it talks about various issues on disturbing the peace. On another place, however, at subsection 14, it specifically allows firing firearms at shooting ranges that are authorized by the municipal officers. In our various meetings of the ordinance subcommittee, we did hear of one licensing in 1955, and most recently Maureen has been able to find an actual written document uh, from the municipal officers, the three selectmen, uh, which were Donald L. Philbrick and Bill Jordan, two of the three I know very well, knew very well, uh, in 1961, uh, specifically authorizing the Sporink Rod and Gun Club. So to the extent that that ordinance continues to be raised, remember, it has a provision in it that authorizes the firing of weapons, therefore the noise created by them, if appropriately licensed by the municipal officers, which is the case in this instance. Uh, so I make that point to emphasize it because Maine state law is very clear, and I won't give you the site I'm sure you've all seen it in various reports, but it specifically states that a municipality can't adopt a noise ordinance that through the adoption of that ordinance would either limit or prohibit shooting occurring at shooting ranges uh, that had occurred before the adoption of that ordinance on a regular basis. So 
you've got the municipal ordinance on one side with an appropriate licensing, and you've got a state law that says if there's been shooting at a, a range on a regular basis, we can't, through a noise ordinance, act to prohibit the activity there. Now, note that that talks about it in terms of a noise ordinance. The ordinance that's before this council deals in part with noise, but much more deals with public safety and go, allows for a process by which, if the council goes forward with this, that the Spurwink Rodden Gun Club as an existing gun club would be licensed and there would be a public safety review and at the same time cont contains a process in case someone, for whatever reason, uh, proposed a new range somewhere in town. So that's a, a general overview of where we are. And the last thing I would note is that the existing firearms ordinance of the town of Cape Elizabeth at section 9.1.1 .1 allows the discharge of firearms affirmatively at the Spurwink Rotten Gun Club. So you, in terms of documentation and what has been permitted and what is permitted and what is limited by state law, that's the parameter that this subcommittee worked within. Thank you. Questions? Council Walsh? Uh, Mr. Cole, could, one of the things that's been presented in a lot of the email traffic we've received um, is the fact that we are now, if we enact this ordinance, establishing a baseline today, not a baseline of 60 years ago, and therefore that baseline today would be, depending upon the application and its completeness, what the current gun club does. Therefore, expansion of that club would then be determined as a result of that application and its completeness and acceptance. Is that true? Absolutely true. And that same state law does allow, based on that type of baseline, regulation in regard to noise. If the particular use is expanded, absolutely. From, t from the baseline? From whatever baseline is established through the licensing process, that's correct. Okay, so if you read the email traffic that has come to us, you could argue that many of the folks who've written to us have basically said to us, do nothing. Because by establishing that baseline, we are accepting what exists today, provided the application is complete and accepted. So it's, it's kind of an interesting place. Um, do nothing, and we still have the same argument, and we can add to the record that Kathy so eloquently stated another 20 more memos on the subject. But it's, it's interesting from my perspective. What I gleaned from a couple of them was that they clearly did not want a baseline established given the current environment. Well, again, given the companion statute to the one that limits municipalities, which basically prohibits any action uh, by abutters who have moved to the shooting range, mm -hmm. absent the town adopting a licensing ordinance and establishing a baseline, yeah. there's no way that those abutters could have any kind of enforcement going forward. Right. Well, thank you. Anyone else? Councilor Sherman. Sort of along the lines of what Councilor Walsh just said, you know, the, the, the complaint that I am reading in these emails is that 10 years ago when some people moved to Cross Hill, it wasn't nearly as bad as it is now. And so is it, is it possible for us to go back in time, if you will, and try to determine what the baseline was 10 years ago uh, and, and, and regulate noise uh, on that basis to try to uh, prevent the type of activity that is allegedly, according to these folks, going on today, which is far worse than 10 years ago? Simple the answer is no. Um, it was a licensed gun club based on the historical record that we've been able to determine. It, the discharge of firearms was permitted by the existing ordinance, um, and there was no ordinance in place that otherwise regulated them within the town. Uh, so no, you can't go back and establish a baseline. Plus, again, that's a simple answer. I suppose the 
the difficult answer would be basically that it's impossible uh, because, because there'd be no way to actually come up with empirical data. It would all be somebody's recollection. And again, through our subcommittee meetings to date, recollection differed substantially. Therefore, there is nothing to point to as objective real data to establish that baseline. So if, if we were to, to ignore the request for a regulation today to enact a new ordinance today, and if the use can expand it, and I'm not going to take sides on whether it has or it hasn't, but let's just say it expanded again in another 10 years, uh, and people came back to us, would be facing sort of the same problem, only the use could potentially be even greater. A absolutely, that's correct. Anyone else? Councilor Sherman. Uh, was there much discussion uh, at the ordinance committee level about uh, hours of operation? I saw it was uh, eight in the morning until a half an hour. Is it before or after? Sunset? Before. So, before. before. Yeah. Um, yes. We all sort of know when the sun sets. We all you get those calendars, and you. I'm just wondering, does that sort of open up problems by, by not defining a, a specific time based on the season, for example? Potentially, that was one of the items raised that because initially we were dealing with a half an hour after sunrise, and after it was correctly pointed out by a member of the audience uh, that that meant some people might be out there at 5:30 uh, in the, on June 21st. Um, or quarter of six anyway, uh, we set specific opening hours and yeah. adjusted it that way. But certainly the council through your public hearing process can adjust it further. Mm -hmm. I've got a question. Um, we've had some emails uh, alleging that some of the, ordin some of the parts of our ordinance uh, that are allowing, that would propose to allow a phasing in of, of changes, uh, safety changes and so forth, to give them time, would not, couldn't, some folks are saying this really is not a hardship on the part of the gun club to, to, to do this. And so I would like you to address that hardship issue and why we were very concerned about that in the ordinance committee's work. It basically goes back to the fact that the gun club itself is in fact a grandfathered use and a grandfathered facility. And based on that, it has not only its Second Amendment rights to shoot guns, but it uh, also has 14th Amendment rights for due process to protect its property rights. And the type of action that, would, that the town could pass that would not recognize the practical difficulties that they may confront in complying with this ordinance could potentially trip the town over into a position where, by regulation, you were uh, taking away property rights in, inappropriately. Uh, this ordinance doesn't say, yes, this is permissible, or no, that's not. What it does is establish a series of criteria that both the Shooting Range Committee and then the Council in licensing will review and make a determination that attempts to balance those property rights against the public safety. And that's going to be a difficult process for this council and that's your shooting range committee. But we've tried to craft something that does its best to do that just that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, one other thing that I would, would like you to address um, is the, the concern that some citizens have, have uh, brought up about uh, safety evaluation. And as the Ordinance Committee was working on this, we thought that that would be a far more appropriate activity uh, for the Firing Range Committee to undertake. Would you mind just telling the audience and the other councils why we really thought that would be more appropriate in that venue than? Sure. Well, the Firing Range Committee is designed in this ordinance, assuming it happens as it's drafted, uh, basically will contain a couple of counselors, but will also contain some individuals, one from the club and another a, a, a certified safety instructor, um, who will have an ability to review that sort of, again, additional baseline data, if you want to call it that, uh, which would be a, a safety report, which 
And there's nothing in this ordinance that says that shouldn't be required. In fact, it's, it's open-ended as to the requirements that the shooting range committee itself can make as a part of the initial application and that the council itself might later require in order to move forward and grant the license. Again, we've done, we, what we did attempted to do, and again, you'll have a public hearing in a month on it, I, I hope, um, is design a format to go forward that allows for public input on both sides of the issue through and to what is hopefully a somewhat impartial group to, to try to weigh that balance between the property rights of the club, the constitutional rights under the Second Amendment, and the public safety of the citizens at large. And I'm not, for an instant, trying to say that that's an easy process. And I'm very happy that I'm not one of these elected counselors. I'm sure it's going to be a difficult process. But we've tried to come up with one that's as fair as possible. Thank you. Councilor, Councilor Ray? I just wanted to um, sort of add to what um, Mr. Cole has said. We um, talked a lot about the Fire and Range Committee and what the makeup of that would be. Um, and so we determined that it was for, for consideration by the Town Council. We determined that would be one member of the Spurwink Rod and Gun Club who is a member of the NRA to be de designated by the Spurwink Rod and Gun Club. So they will select that individual one member of the public at large to be appointed by the town council, um, one member of the public at large who is a certified firearms instructor to be appointed by the town council. And that was a, a discussion that we had with the chief of police and how you know he might suggest that that person would be somebody who had that kind of knowledge. Um, and then two members of the town council. So. We tried to put together this committee that would be a bunch of people who are coming at it from different perspectives. So I know that uh, Mr. Cole doesn't necessarily have that right in front of him, but I, I just wanted to uh, fill that in so for people who might want to know that. Thank you. Council Walsh. Yeah, and Kathy, that, uh, if I remember correctly, Ben, the, the, uh, the code enforcement officer, was on the original recommended list. Yes. We had a lot of discussion around trying to keep him out of that group, keeping him at arm's length, if you will. Yes. Relative to the whole process. The, the same thing as, um, I'm sorry, uh, the same thing as the police chief. At one point it was discussed that the police chief, chief would be on that mm -hmm. committee. But if the police chief is the person who has to um, enforce um, lo the laws, it wasn't appropriate for him to be on that committee. So just mm -hmm. there was a lot of discussion around that it went back and forth to try to get a good mix of people who were all um, you know coming from from different aspects but would sort of fill in the full piece of the puzzle yes. thank you um, further just um, uh, one of the um, this wasn't the first uh, email we received on the subject but um, we did receive an email that talked about uh, the planning board decision as it related to the Dominicus crossing development and the whole issue of notification or notice, if you will. Mm -hmm. And in this particular email, um, this particular citizen laid a lot of blame at our doorstep as, as town councilors or as government relative to the fact that some of what had been suggested in that planning board um, approval never happened and that was the whole deed issue and uh, the statements that were discussed in in that process so I just wonder you know what happened does anybody have any background on what did take place relative to that Mike? yeah you know I would want to verify this but my recollection is that the planning board had all of those discussions mm -hmm. But when they did the final approval vote for Dominica's Crossing, it was not a condition of approval that that occur. Okay. They did not dot the I and cross the T. Right. So that would explain then why it didn't go, go forward. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Councilmember Coslin. I just wanted to confirm 
what uh, the town manager just said because I spoke with Maureen O'Meara about that specifically today and she confirmed that as well that the planning board did discuss it but it was not contained in the final approvals so the final approval would have been the signed mylar that was accepted for that development and it's not there it, it's not on there's, there's two components to any approval there's, there's the sign mylar as, as you would call it although there's a uh, site plan approval it's called and there's also the planning board motion uh, approving the subdivision with the conditions of approval I, I do caution Councilor McCausland I, do, I don't know I had a conversation with Maureen today and I told her that and I don't know if she independently confirmed it or relied on me so uh, yeah just uh, I think we, we need to go back and double check the documents but that that's my recollection having looked at this at some point within the last uh, six months okay thank you thank you, thank you. okay uh, anything else any other questions for mr. Cole thank you very much thank you <clears throat> okay we'll now proceed I suspect there are individuals in the audience that would like to comment so before we begin uh, there will be a 15 minute total uh, time allowed there are three minutes per person uh, please state your name your address and I'll be timing you <laughs> and if everyone would please remember that we will all conduct ourselves with civility thank you good evening my name is Eric from I live at 64 Cross Hill I reject the idea that uh, simply by allowing shooting a town therefore allows any and all unlimited noise from that shooting if that were true main title 30a would simply not be necessary if that were true why do all other clubs um, secure such large much larger parcels of land uh, please don't take my word for it I know you've been uh, in receipt of an alternate legal analysis explaining this um, maybe a judge needs to decide this and clarify this for all um, but it's I reject out of hand the idea that just because you allow shooting that no noise could law can apply why else would the state of Maine uh, um, pass Title 30A? I fear that Cape Elizabeth is positioning itself to pass a law that is both bad and at odds with that title, um, Title 30A, Section 311. I'm here to beg you not to make that mistake. The state of Maine, long ago, recognized that there would be tension between shooting clubs and citizens because of noise. The compromise the state came up with is that it would be unfair to impose brand new standards of quiet upon pre-existing, non-expanding shooting ranges. Fine. But that law is unambiguously deferential to municipalities with pre-existing noise standards like Cape Elizabeth. Limitation, it reads, a municipal noise control ordinance may not require or be applied so as to require a sport shooting range to eliminate or eliminate, to limit or eliminate shooting activities that have occurred on a regular basis at the range prior to the enactment date of the ordinance period. The state law implicitly accepts the applicability of noise laws that were enacted first. It then explicitly reaffirms the town's authority to regulate new noise if a gun club expands its activity, which, as dozens of people have told you, Spurwink has. So, the state law prohibits towns without noise laws from punishing pre-existing gun clubs by retrofitting new standards of quiet as determined by the town. Fine. Meanwhile, our town, which has a pre-spurring pre noise law, is now preparing to punish neighbors by retrofitting a new standard of loudness that will effectively be determined by the gun club itself. That would be legislative insanity, an action clearly out of step with the clear intent of Title 30A's validation of pre-shooting range noise ordinances. There's no intelligent way to interpret that law as meaning that gun club noise is unregulatable. It simply places one narrow limitation on that authority that towns are plainly acknowledged to retain. As of this moment, our town's noise problem relates to the executive failure to invoice, enforce relevant law. But if you pass Mr. Cole's ordinance and retroactively permit the club's extreme noise, you will be putting decades of non-enforcement failure squarely onto your own shoulders. Two wrongs don't make a right. This town has been wrong to not enforce applicable laws, especially as the need for them has grown in parallel with the club's own growth. But passing Mr. Cole's ordinance would be a second, much greater wrong. Please don't pass the buck. Don't outsource our safety concerns to an unproven committee. And don't take away noise laws, though that, though currently, currently not enforced, are still on the books, still filled with all the promise that Cape Elizabeth makes its citizens. Please, don't bend over backwards to let the gun club violate our laws, stand up straight for us, and require their enforcement. Let's not spend any more of the town's money on legal advice that doesn't even acknowledge our laws or proposes to let the gun club, for all intents and purposes, determine its own baseline of acceptable noise. Could I have 10 seconds? Real fast. <laughs> the only baseline that should matter is the pre-existing noise ordinance of this town. That's what Title 38 allows. If the town specifically exempted gun noise, not the act of shooting, but 
if the town ex specifically exempts the excessive gun noise from its own control, just show us that in writing, or at least be straightforward and honorable and amend the disturbing of the peace ordinance. Please enforce the law or just change it straight up. Don't let CAPE continue to make promises it won't keep. Thank, Thank you, you Dr. for the Sam. extra time. Hi, my name is Tammy Walter. I live at 1095 Sawyer Road in Cape Elizabeth. I've lived there for 18 years. The gun club is located one mile from my home. The sound of gunfire has always been a part of life in my neighborhood. Um, the sound hasn't changed in the last 10, 20, since I've been there. Two years ago, I purchased a handgun, and lucky for me, I knew right where to go to safely practice. Last Thursday, February 6th, I was elected the new president of the Spurwink Rod and Gun Club. I decided to take this position for two reasons. Number one, I personally care about the club and our members. Number two, I took this position because I believe our members' commitment to be safe and responsible part, to be a safe and responsible part of our community. I know the members of our club. I've met them on the range. Some of them are my neighbors, and some of them are my closest friends. I've spent time with them at our suppers when we sit around eating chili and cornbread. They are good, respectful, law-abiding citizens. We just are trying to get together in our community and have a safe place to practice shooting. This club has an excellent 57-year safety record. Safety is my number one priority. My goal and my hope is that our club is in harmony with the community and all our neighbors. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mark Mion, the former president of Spurwink Ground and Gun Club. Um, there are a couple changes that I'd like to see uh, in the ordinance itself. Um, one is uh, in section 24-6-3 concerning warning signs. Uh, as reading through this, I realized that uh, the distance that was in here of 100 feet would actually contradict state law. So I'd like to drop that distance down from 100 feet down to 50 feet. Um, also, in section 24-8-4, subsection 3, this states projected noise contours sufficient to, to demonstrate compliance as determined by an engineer. Um, because we are an existing club, uh, my opinion would be is that this would contradict our uh, exemption given to us in uh, 30 AM RSA. And uh, also, uh, the club submitted a 13-point document, I don't know if anyone has seen it yet, that, uh, that is a basis for our new layout. I'm requesting a workshop so uh, our club can convey our plans and our timelines to not only inform the council, but the residents of Cape Elizabeth to our, our plans moving forward. Uh, we believe this would be an immense help in crafting the final wording of the ordinance. And one final thing I realized here, it just came to me. We already have an ordinance on the books for firearms. Um, I was wondering if there's a way, after we're able to go into workshop and the town and the council sees where the club's going and what we're putting in place and our timelines, uh, if we could maybe move uh, what the club's going to do into that, into the firearms ordinance um, <clears throat> and kind of exempt us out of the shooting range ordinance. Um, this might actually get us, with the 13-page with the document, this might actually get us exactly where we want to go. Um, maybe, albeit not at the same speed that a lot of residents around us would like to see, but it would definitely address everyone's uh, concerns as far as safety. Um, 
and timelines. Thank you very much. Oh, um, in that 13-point document, there is a portion in there where the club says that we, because I realize it's extremely difficult to see what is uh, expansion of range use, the club would agree to uh, cap our membership. Uh, it's a definable way of, of, I guess, showing existing, um, existing as we are exist now or expansion in the future by having that in there. It kind of allows us to show that we're not expanding. Thank you. Hi. Hi. I'm Kathy Klein, 66 Cross Hill. I know you addressed the issue of the independent range evaluation already, but I would like to emphasize that residents of the town would be a lot more comfortable if there were a range evaluation done. I think it would just make people feel more at ease that there is, that the club is indeed safe as it stands today. Um, I know there's room for improvement, but we all know that accidents do happen at shooting ranges, and we want to know where it stands today in terms of shot containment. And we feel that uh, having a professional range evaluation would go a long way in assuring not just the neighbors, but the residents of the town in general, that it is indeed a safe place. Um, and I don't think until we get a range evaluation done that people can be assured that it is safe. Um, I also would just reiterate that we do recognize that Spurwink does have a right to be there. They've been there for more than 50 years, but at the same time, they've also had more than 50 years to make it a safe place. So we still call for that range evaluation to either be part of the ordinance or to be um, called for by the town council. Thank you. Anyone else? <clears throat> my, na my name is Ralph Romano, and <clears throat> I live on uh, Tiger Lily Lane. Uh, I had a big, long thing here, but I'm going to skip most of it and go right down to the bottom. I hope the town government functions as it should to protect the residents, but if it does not, the neighbors seem to have no alternative for relief other than bringing legal action against the town and the gun club. And the more I listen to, you know, the, all, lawyer, the, all lawyers don't have the same opinion. I know the town has hired one, he's come up with an opinion. And I'm sure there are other lawyers out there that have widely different opinions than what he's come up with. And I think, I honestly think that the best place to settle this is probably in court. Thank you. Thank you. Rich Moran, 62 Cross Hill Road. Uh, my only comment has to do with, uh, I've been to a number of the workshops. There are a lot of people who put a lot of work into this ordinance and trying to strike a balance between the needs of the neighborhood and the town and the club. Uh, so I was really shocked when Councilman Walsh said the best course of action might be to do nothing, which seems to me would only increase the problems we've got right now in terms of the relationship between the town, the club, and the neighbors. Um, so I don't know. I think it would be an abrogation of your responsibilities not to put in place this ordinance, which I think is balanced. I mean, it acknowledges the right of the club to exist. And I think the ordinance itself protects the town, protects the club. We're still never going to be able to get rid of the noise aggravation, but there's always a safety issue there. And I think the town having oversight of that is a good idea. So. I certainly don't agree with a do-nothing approach, Councilman. I don't know where the issue of uh, establishing a baseline from 10 years ago, the only thing you could do measurably would say, how many members did the club have 10 years ago and what do they have today? And I don't know if Mark would want to do a weapon inventory. He could probably tell you what the difference in sound might be. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jamie Wagner, 30 Hannaford Cove Road. I was, I, I'm here as a citizen, not as a council member. Um, I, I wasn't planning on talking today, and I haven't spoken in the past about this, but it's more of a legal 
point that I'd like to make to address what David's question was to, the, to Mr. Cole. And that was, and I heard Mr. Cole respond that he didn't, he gave a response of no, essentially you couldn't go back to a baseline of 10 years ago. Um, the way, I, I take a, a bit of a legal challenge to that because I might not have been practicing law as long as Mr. Cole, but I have been practicing law for 22 years as a litigator. And the way I'd interpret section 3011, subsection three, which states nothing in this section limits the ability of a municipality to regulate noise produced by the expansion of activity at sport shooting range is something that would be up to a fact finder. And there is you know, ample opportunity, maybe not in front of this uh, boost body, but in front of another body to do discovery and determine what the baseline was 10 years ago through testimony and other sorts of discovery techniques. Uh, so I kind of reject the notion that you couldn't try to determine whether or not there's been an expansion of activity at a sport shooting range. And I think it would be appropriate of the council to try to make that determination. Thank you. We have time for one more. Good evening. My name is Mark Casey. I live at 10 um, Apple Tree Lane. It is in the Cross Hill Excuse neighborhood. Excuse me, your last name, please. Casey, C A S E Y. Thank you. I uh, want to thank uh, the town council, first of all, for taking this into consideration. Um, I attended a meeting back in October, and at that meeting, it was voted that uh, Councilman Wagner should uh, be recused from that meeting, and I applauded, I applauded that decision. Um, it had a lot to do with um, making certain that there, there were no special interests involved in this, and that, you know, at the same time, it talked about credibility. But as I see these two groups coming together over the last several months, um, there seems to be an impasse, and at the same time, there seems to be certain lack. The gun club, I think, has, has taken it upon themselves to not be forthright with folks. I'm talking mostly about the, uh, the decision to have a, uh, a gun club inspection. And I've not seen the results of that. Maybe it's been made available, and I've, I'm not aware of that. Uh, it seems to me that there needs to be a more independent safety inspection that takes place at this gun club. Um, you know, all types of things are done by independent, and I think, I think perhaps the board needed to get in there, the, the council needed to get in there and say, let's agree on an independent inspection, because uh, we don't know, and I, I, at the same time, I'm mostly concerned with safety. I don't appreciate the noise. I'm concerned with gun safety, and I think that needs to be demonstrated here before this is allowed to go down there, that road of, we'll give you a year to do this. Um, I do object strenuously to the fact that this is going to continue without a, without a clear safety inspection um, that, that people feel good with. Um, that's really, that's what all I had to say tonight. Thank you. The co uh, public comment session is now closed. So, to the Councilors, uh, I'm sorry, Council Wagner, we're not, <laughs> we're not through with item 38 yet. <laughs> um, do I have a motion to uh, uh, receive the report of the Ordinance Committee uh, proposing a new Chapter 24 of the Revised Code of Ordinances and to set a public hearing for Monday, March 10, 2014 at 7 p.m. here at the Cape Elizabeth Town Hall on the proposed shooting range ordinance? Council Ray. So moved. Council Seconded. Hall? Is there any discussion? Walsh. Any discussion? Councilor Sherman. Uh, I, I'm going to vote in favor of the motion, obviously. Uh, typically, after we have a public hearing, uh, we have in the past just voted that night. Uh, I think this would be the type of issue that we will uh, do what we did with the last very difficult issue and have the vote perhaps the following month, or it's always possible that the council may decide we need. I'm getting buzzed. Sorry. Oh my gosh. <laughs> an, equal, uh, an equal opportunity uh, man. time. <laughs> I love it. Um, we may decide that we need an additional workshop, it, it, depending on what we learn. So I would encourage people to come out and speak at the public hearing. Um, we've heard a lot of uh, good feedback to date and uh, continue to welcome that. Uh, and I also would echo the last gentleman's comment. In my view, safety is the major issue. And that's, that's certainly what I'm going to focus on. 
Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor? The motion carries. Elsa Wagner, <laughs> you may return. <laughs> Item number 39, Fort Williams Park Annual Review of the Fort, Fort Williams Park Revenues. Um, Yes, I was looking for Bill Brownell, He's but here. if the town manager would uh, introduce this, this item, and I think maybe we'll yeah. probably hear from the chairman of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. Chairman Brownell. Yeah, I just wanted to introduce this item on the Fort Williams revenues. Every year, the Fort Williams Advisory Commission looks at uh, the, the different revenue policies for Fort Williams Park. One of the revenue policies they looked at uh, was on whether or not commercial tourist vans ought to be part of uh, the fee structure uh, as buses and trolleys are. Uh, did you, Chairman Brownell, wish to provide a further explanation um, on that? Cha the chairman. Uh, cha cha chairman Sullivan, well. I'm prepared to, to make an amendment to this, um, this particular component, but Bill could explain their rationale. But I'll let him explain the rationale, and then I'd like to make an amendment. Thank you. Good evening. Mr. Bill Brownell, Brownell welcome. I'm Cedar Ledge Road, Cape Elizabeth. Um, <laughs> the advisory commission uh, recommended, and you have before you our recommendation to amend the, the uh, bus and trailer fee schedule to include commercial vans, which was a gap that we did not realize until it was brought to uh, Mike, uh, Mike's uh, attention earlier this year. Basically, what we want to do is fill that gap so that the fee schedule is fair and consistent to all commercial vendors, uh, uh, buses and vans. We've done that. We have a proposal. We talked to uh, uh, Councilman Walsh, who is going to make a recommendation or a proposal to amend it. And, and uh, I, as the chair, have no objection to the amendment. Um, the, we'd, we'd like to amend that to $500 per vehicle per season, as opposed to the 800 that's listed in your packet here. Um, and part of the rationale behind this is that this is a startup uh, business, and in the interest uh, of uh, working with the particular business owner, this is, gives the person the chance to, to ramp up their biz, business model to afford uh, the fees that are being charged, not unlike the way we burned in some of the other fees that we put in place a year ago or two years ago. So, so it's... Uh, moving the item with 500 there. And it's yeah. Okay. Um, so what, what I would uh, suggest, Council Walsh, is that you make a motion so to approve, uh, to uh, accept the item with that change. Yeah. And so I would, I would then uh, move to um, order that uh, the town council approve the following fees for commercial tourist vans, with the amendment of uh, the commercially operated passenger tour vans, making 30 visits to the park in a season to $500 per vehicle per season, and the rest would be as it stands. And second. Is there any discussion? Council Wagner. Yeah, uh, Jim, are you, are you talking about one particular entity or uh, the way I read this? There, Bill? There is just one entity in, in uh, Greater Portland that uh, is, is uh, providing this service at this time. The owner of that business was here earlier, met with, uh, with uh, Jim Walsh and myself, and uh, has agreed to the $500, which will allow him to recreate his business plan over the, over the next several months, and then maybe at a future date we can increase it. Uh, but we all think it's appropriate uh, at, at this stage, at this time. Do you know how many visits uh, he makes uh, season two? Department? He has two vans uh, through the summer after September, when the cruise ships are in, he increases his fleet to uh, five vans, and he's prepared to uh, 
accept that fee for his fleet. Through, through the summer, he's, he's there two or three times a day. So that's a per band problem? Yes. Yes, it is. Yes, that's a special arrangement that was worked out a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. If I might. Yes. Yeah. Most of the buses are the cruise ship buses, and we worked out with, with them that there's a discount if uh, we don't have to collect it each time. We do a billing. It's, it's, you know, we, the greeters keep track, but it's also partially on the honor system, and it seems to have worked really well. And, Michael, do you have an idea of what revenue is coming from that $40 visit from the tour buses? Uh, the total income, do you have it on the... Uh, this, this, pa on this past year, the fees we've collected through the trolleys and the buses is uh, north of $27,000. We project it will be uh, north of 30 next year. Yeah, and that's kind of the reason I asked the question is because uh, it seems that if we're going to reduce it for the passenger vans as they increase their frequency to the park, that it might put a, the tour buses at a disadvantage and they're the bigger revenue generator? Um, can I answer, can I answer Absolutely. that? What we heard from the operator, uh, Jamie, earlier is that um, all of the tour bus um, participants are purchasing their ticket on the ship. So it's kind of a captive, if you will, in terms of how that works. Whereas his business, he's not, he doesn't have that direct link, if you will. Um, he's actually, he's picking up, I guess, what you would call the stragglers that are not buying it as part of a package on board the ship. So. Okay. Councilor McCausland. So, similarly, is the trolley price at $1,500 per season higher because they're... The, the capacity of those trolleys is twice as... The, the trolleys can hold 30 passengers. Um, and they they have in fact been paying that fifteen hundred dollars uh, per trolley per uh, um, for the last uh, two years now. So this the, what is before you is just the new por uh, portion with regards to the commercial vans, which are in essence less than hold less than fifteen people. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, just out of curiosity, I met the park quite early in the warmer months of the year, you know, 5.36 in the morning, and every so often, at least about once or twice a week, I will see a, a tour bus show up at 6 in the morning, and I have no idea whether they're uh, honorably complying with our fee structure, nor, nor am I about to ask, uh, but if I see them, and I, I actually have the names of a few of them, I won't say them uh, here publicly, but maybe this is to the town manager, do I direct that inquiry to you or to Bob Malley? Because it, it, it seems very odd to me. They're showing up at 5.30, quarter of 6, and I sometimes wonder if they're trying to avoid paying the fee. You know, <laughs> that's the way the world works, David. <laughs> you know, people will do whatever they want to do to avoid fees. You know, under, under the rules, everyone's required to, to provide the fee. But, you know, there could be a bus that shows up there today, and, you know, they're not going to pay it. We're not going to collect it. Uh, you know, I think, you know, the, the, the major point is, is, is that, you know, through the greeter program and through uh, the rangers and, you know, through the cooperation of the industry, you know, we're, we're looking at $30,000 in revenue that we didn't have uh, two years ago. And we, in, in this latest proposal is, a, is trying to make it as fair as possible to everyone in the industry that on a commercial basis brings tourists to the park. There are always going to be some that we don't get, and you know we we could have someone staff there every hour with the gates open, and you know get some more money, but I think it would cost us more money to to uh, to do that. Anyone else? Yeah, Council I, I just wanted to comment, follow up on David's point that it's my understanding that there is, although it's self-policed, there's also park employees that keep a an eye on it so that, that they, they know how many buses are coming in and out so if, if you're worried about the honor system there's a kind of a check in place 
there will always be a few rogue buses that, <laughs> that come in at 6 o'clock in the morning. But if you're there, you can, it's $40 if you want to tell the All driver. Right. I'll, I'll, I'll politely <laughs> inform them of the rule. If, if, if I might say, from the beginning, the town council asked us not to be rude in front of tourists, not to get into battles with, with individuals. And, uh, you know, I think our staffs maintained that policy. And, you know, what we, we, we tend to do is get the information and we follow it up afterward. Uh, but we, we still have some, you know, in, 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 in the business of serving and charging money, uh, not everyone is going to be universally happy. And I, I understand from Bob that uh, uh, this is all overseen by Gene Gross, and it, it it's, is. It, it's been very successful. So. And, and the Greeter program in particular for me has been yes. really helpful in, in, in collecting the monies and making sure they're collected, but also has is, is really been great in terms of giving people a welcome to the park and in promoting local businesses, which is, you know, we, we try to work closely with Cape Business Alliance and we give out maps and other materials that they provide us to give to all the tourists. And, uh, we're really pleased that we're now doing that as well. Okay, thank Councilman. Warren. I just want to make one point. In the interest of making sure people understand, especially those at home, that we do read people's emails because this uh, commercially operated passenger tour van um, provision was modified because we had a citizen write us a letter and tell us it should be a commercial plate. So this wasn't on there originally. It wasn't stated that way. So it could have been anybody with a 16 passenger van without a commercial plate that would have come under this particular provision. So we did make a change. So we do listen to people and uh, we appreciate emails that uh, put us on the right track. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Do I, <clears throat> I think we're ready to vote. All those in favor? And it's unanimous. <clears throat> okay, moving on, item number 40, the Fort Williams Park Annual Group Use Requests. It is proposed to approve the Fort Williams Advisory Commission's recommendation for approval of group use requests for 2014. I see that the Director of Public Works is here. Um, Bob, would you have anything to say? I know you're uh, the staff of this committee. Anything, and I hope you're feeling better. <laughs> uh, Bob Malley, uh, Malley, Director of Public Works. These are your, the annual use requests that come to the commission uh, for use of the park, uh, and uh, they're pretty standard fare from previous years, and uh, there's nothing abnormal out of the way on them, so. It, Yes. If I might, through the chair, ask Bob a question. In the materials that I received, the PDF with all these, the Cape Elizabeth High School graduation was not included. I pr presume that also needs to be approved. That's correct. So if, if the council is, there hasn't been a motion on this yet, but if so, if, if a councilor could add uh, Cape Elizabeth High School graduation, including setup, and then we'll, we'll put the dates next to that, whatever their letter said. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good. Do I have such a motion? Council Walsh. Um, I, uh, I moved that uh, we approve the Fort Wayne Advisory Commission's recommendation for uh, group use request for 2014 with the following amendment to include the Cape Elizabeth High School graduation and its setup prior to the event. Second. Councilor Ray, any more discussion? Any questions for Bob Malley? Okay. All those in favor? Thank you, Bob. Great, thank you. Item number 41. I'm sorry. Item number 41, Trout Brook Grant authorizations. Um, I will uh, ask the town manager to tell us about this. Yeah, uh, back in September 2013, the council authorized us to submit a grant application to the main DEP uh, for some improvements to Trout Brook, its restoration. Uh, working uh, with some farms there, working with uh, some neighbors. So we work with the city of South Portland, working with the Cumberland County uh, Soil and Water Conservation Service, with the Church of Latter-day Saints, with the water, Walnut Hill Equestrian Center, with Nick Tamaro. And the good news is it was, it was all approved. So uh, we'd now like to do the follow-up uh, and uh, ask you to accept the grant, to authorize the submission to the planning board uh, 
for the work that's to be done and to improve an amendment to the community fee utilization program, which provides this is one of the projects that would be do that. Our, if you remember, our cash contribution is part of the $25,000 amount. Uh, it's not quite all of it, but most of it that uh, Eastman Meadows paid as part of uh, truck work impairment under the, under the applicable ordinance in the site location of development law. Thank you. Is there a motion? I have a motion on the item. Councilor Ray. Um, I move to, one, accept the grant, two, authorize the submission to the planning board, and three, approve amendment of the CFUP program. Is there a second? Second. Councilor Sherman. Any discussion? Any questions for Mike? The town manager? It's pretty straightforward. Thank you for that introduction. I just had one. Um, the, could you just give us a quick review of the community fee utilization program and why? Uh, yep. Just that section at the end. I don't. B back when this program was set up, of, and, con and this is all following con in conjunction with, uh, you know, a state requirement when truck work was known mm -hmm. to be impaired. Yep. Uh, they required both South Fulton and Cape Elizabeth to come up with provisions to protect truck work so that uh, the impairment would be lessened. As part of that whole structure that the state has in place uh, is something, uh, is a set of fees that you put in place, mm -hmm. and it's called the Community Fee Utilization Program. At the time that that fee is put in place, you're required to have a, a list of the types of things that it might be spent on. Uh, and, you know, different things were listed. What was not specifically listed was this project. Mm -hmm. So this this, it, this dots the I's, cross the T's, and indicates that this particular project uh, would be listed as part of that, uh, part of that uh, utilis original. allowed for utilization. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Item number 42, schools organic recycling. It is proposed to renew an agreement with Maine Waste Solutions to provide for recycling of food waste within the schools. Um, Bob Malley has left, so. He uh, left it to me. He left, uh, yeah. <laughs> so if the town manager could, manager could just uh, brief us on this item, this yeah. last item. This is a program we have uh, with the food waste at the elementary school, the middle school, and the high school, primarily the two cafeterias in those two schools. And what we, we have is 10 bins there that uh, generate food waste. Uh, two days a week, uh, as, as Dave Sherman would remember, at one point this started with students and a school board member was storing the food waste in her backyard. And, <laughs> uh, you know, everyone tried to do well, but uh, a few years ago it was professionalized where we we deal with this outfit that now uses the name of Maine Waste Solutions. Uh, a couple of graduates of the Muskie School put this business together. Uh, they have a site currently out at the uh, Riverside Disposal Area, Riverton Disposal Area in the city of Portland. And basically they, they come and pick all the trash, take it off the hands of the school department. We pay for the fees for it. And uh, it's, it's a model program, it's, it costs money. Uh, the, the fees here are, uh, uh, 1140 uh, month. average monthly service fee uh, for the you know we don't do it during the summer but for the other months that it's in place and uh, that's paid for our municipal budget as a way of uh, encouraging uh, good uh, good example to young people of uh, environmental stewardship as well as uh, ensuring that it's done and it also you know diverts uh, saves the town money because we're not paying the per ton fee by EcoMaine. Right. EcoMaine also has an item on their agenda uh, coming the next meeting. Uh, to sp right now, the, the waste handling agreement says all waste must go to EcoMaine, and they're putting in a waiver, uh, particular uh, for programs such as this, until such time that they are prepared to actually accept food waste. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's the story. Thank you. Uh, I have a motion on item number 42. Can someone make a motion? Council Walsh? Uh, I move that we um, renew an agreement with Maine Waste Solutions to provide for recycling of food waste within our schools. And a second? Second. Sherman? 
Any more discussion? Council Walsh. I'm sorry, Council Wagner. Uh, just a couple questions from Mike. So, uh, just the first one is this food waste goes into composting, is that right? Yeah, it, it, it goes to the, the Riverton area, and there's this, there's this structure that's outside there. And I've toured it. I, I don't recommend it highly because, for obvious reasons. Uh, but it, yeah, all sorts of food waste. From, they, 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 most of their customers are restaurants in the city of Portland and South Portland. And it all goes there, and they, uh, they have a test to do all that, and they sell it as a product. They, their income stream is their pickup program as well as uh, uh, their sale of the material. But even before they sell the material, they, they need to have it tested and make sure that it's uh, good stuff. So then the second question was, you, you mentioned, but there is a savings versus doing it through EcoMain? Yep. Okay, great. There is a savings, although because EcoMain keeps dropping its fees, mm -hmm. uh, the savings is not as great as it once was, which is good. Okay, anything else? All those in favor? Oh, I'm sorry, Councilman Cosman. So, um, Mike, that term of three years, and we've had good experience with them, and they've had good experience with us. In other words, we've been in compliance. We haven't thrown plastic or metal or something that shouldn't be in there. They're not fining us or no. penalizing us. They've been very happy with the relationship. Uh, they, you know, in fact, you know, a couple of emails went back and forth today because, based on a meeting I had earlier today, I had a couple of questions, and Bob talked to them, and you know, they they really emphasized how much they enjoy working with us. And, it's, it's been a really good relationship. Right. Thank you. Okay. In fact, you know, we've even had some discussions with them of doing some sort of a, more of a pilot at the refuse disposal area, the recycling center. But we'll see. All right. All those, are we all set? All those in favor? It's unanimous. And I see no citizens from the public left. So could I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Council Chairman, thank you. Council Walsh? Seconded. All those in favor? It's unanimous. We are adjourned.